him. I will do my very best to not just turn into a complete fanboy. <laughs> I don't want to make you uncomfortable, but this is really exciting for me. I've been a, a fan of yours for a long time. Well, thank thanks, Jim, and I'm really, really pleased to and honored to uh, be asked to to do this, and happy to talk about uh, uh, whatever we come up with. Um, and uh, yeah, I've certainly enjoyed getting to know you a little bit through email and a few different projects, shared projects that way. So um, thanks for thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. I, I hope that we'll see if it's if it's a positive experience. If it's a positive enough experience for you, there are I can think just right off the top of my head of so many things I'd love to talk to you about. Um, I think the main challenge right now for me is going to be trying to focus just on the Christmas collection and not be like, you know, who makes your bagpipes? And, and what about, right. you know, what about the Ift of Eft's book? I love that book. Tell me about that one, you know. So. <laughs> well, happy, happy to roll with whatever, Jim. No worries. Well, thank you. So, uh, Tim, I think it's at this point, the majority of people listening to this will probably be people in, in, my, in the Garden Valley Pipe Band. Um, though I, I hope that a lot of people will get to hear it because I really love this Christmas collection that you've made. So I'm going to try my best to spread it far and wide. But I know that the people in the Garden Valley Pipe Band will be at least somewhat aware of you because it was your rendition of, uh, oh, what, which title did you use? Was it Bonaparte Crossing in the Rockies? Um, yeah, that or Battle of Waterloo. They're, they're sort of uh, one and the same, more or less. Right. Yeah, we ended up, um, we didn't realize that at the, the same year that we used that in a competition set, uh, another local band, Wasatch and District, also used it. Uh, so we just... They went with one title, and we went, we went, we went with the other. <laughs> but it it's, was, a, it's a great tune. It's a it timeless is, yeah. melody, and, and it's known through in so many different um, corners of the traditional music world. Um, so, yeah, it's a good one to know and, and share. Yeah. So, so our Garden Valley Pipe Band members are going to be at least somewhat aware of you because of that. Um, I think it's probably worth taking just a couple minutes to do just a quick little bio, um, you know, what uh you know what what do you do in the in the bagpiping sphere? Uh, in the bagpiping sphere, uh, I juggle uh, a variety of different tasks and roles, um, wearing different hats, and um, they almost all relate to the pipes in some way or another. So, um, I obviously do the 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 publishing venture, just a tiny tiny cottage industry of of uh, arranging and and typesetting music to look real pretty on the page and then uh, sell that through my website and um, sometimes through other vendors. Um, and um, so that's one piece and that's called the Birchen Music in Publishing, originally called Bay Music. It was a obscure Gaelic word meaning birch, but no one could pronounce it. So I, I and I don't speak Gaelic anyway, so I went with the English. Mm. Um, and so I also teach privately, um, a limited number of students, um, mostly ones that I can see in person in normal times. Um, and I've had some outdoor lessons this, this fall, which has been really nice. Um, now we're into snowy weather. Um, and then performing both um, on my own uh, various concerts and gigs, and then also uh, with Jeremiah McLean, who plays piano, accordion, and piano. Um, we've had a duo, uh, for the most part of 10 years now that, that, um, we lovingly refer to as Weezer and Squeezer. <laughs> you get to decide which one of us is which. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and in more recent years, we've added a third member, Alex Keller from, uh, Sherbrooke, Quebec. Um, and he's been a great compliment and a great addition, both, uh, in terms of just friends getting together to, to play music that we love and, and musically. Um, he's really a very, very gifted player and musician, as is Jeremiah. Um, and then uh, I do some recording as well, um, working on a project at present with uh, Pete Sutherland uh, on fiddle and Brad Kolodner on banjo. That'll be coming out in the new year, hopefully. Um, so multiple, multiple juggling. Uh, I think I'm forgetting something, but we'll, we'll stop there. Okay, for now at least. Exactly. Um, yeah, some some of the stuff I'm, I'm, some of the stuff that you've known with with, uh, with Brian has been like just like really some of my real go to music for years now. I, lo I love some of those arrangements that you guys have and, and some pieces that you've done. I am um, going to make sure 
for anybody listening, hop into the description. I'll make sure to uh, include links to some of my favorite performances um, and definitely to the Birchin Music website um, because that's what I want to talk to you about right now is this collection that you made um, of Advent, Christmas, and Epiphany carols for the Scottish bagpipes. It's called On This Day Earth Shall Ring. And you mentioned, and this is one thing that I really love about everything I've purchased from Birchin Music is that the the typesetting, the paper that it's put on, all of that, the production quality basically of the physical product, it's beautiful. Is do you have printing equipment yourself or do you have people you work with? How does that process work? No, I, I work with the local printers. Um, but I do the all of the all of the typesetting, all of the text, everything uh, here at home and I just send them a giant PDF and they print from that. Um, so, uh, and I just specify what paper I like to use. Usually something, some component of, you know, some percentage of recycled content. Um, try to do my bit for the planet. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, but yeah, all of the typesetting is, and text is all, and art, uh, digging up, you know, artwork that's okay to use, um, and appropriate, hopefully for the for the each collection that's all done uh here at home yeah that's one thing that i really like about the collections anybody interested this collection of course can be purchased on the birch and music uh website there a lot of the tunes maybe maybe even all of them you tell me are also available as individual pdf downloads on there that's right um not all of them yet but a good a good chunk of them and um which includes uh some very familiar carols to the, the general public and then some more obscure ones that I really love uh, and just wanted to sort of record and help promote um, uh, and hoping more people will play them. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's one of the first things. So I had, I was familiar with your collection and Ift of Efts. And from there, I think I went to the, the Appalachian collection. Um, and that one is where I first realized you can read these books, um, you know, throughout. There's a bunch of great little, you know, tune histories, uh, photos and and sketches. Um, there's a lot of really fun information throughout these collections. It's not just the it's not just the sheet music. And that's the case for this uh, Christmassy collection as well. Yeah, I am. Um, I really enjoy the physical uh, nature of of, you know, holding a book, holding paper in your hands and flipping pages and uh, not having advertisements blink at you while you do that. Um, no clickbait. You just, you're focused on what, uh, whatever is in, literally in your hand uh, and you can just peruse and explore, um, but you're always in, you're staying present with whatever that particular book, that publication is about. Yeah. Um, so, and then to add some of those little bits of information, um, I just think it adds to the whole experience, a little bit of supplementary, um, Hey, I bet you didn't know such and such about this Carol and, um, or this might help you appreciate it even more to know this little tidbit, this background or this translation or something like that. Yeah, that's definitely been my experience. I really enjoy reading through them. And in this, in this collection specifically, um, which I should say the title, it's on this day, earth shall ring. Um, I was really surprised as I was going through at how much how much art you were able to find re relating to Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, etc., that features bagpipes. I think there are over 30 images in the book. I should actually get the exact number and, and issue a challenge to see if uh, who can find every piper and embedded within the publication. That's a great idea. <laughs> I, I started as part of the prep for this episode. I just started like keeping a spreadsheet of just like stuff I thought was interesting. And I was putting down all these titles of all these paintings. And yeah, it was, there are a lot. I don't know if I got to 30, but I didn't get, I didn't get through all of them. You know, there, there are so many in there. And I just, you know, I've seen pipes in, in old paintings and stuff here and there, but never presented in such a consistent, you know, collection that's all together. And so it just, it was kind of baffling to me once I realized like, man, there are a lot of these paintings and stuff that, that include pipers, you know? There really are. And most coming from the medieval and Renaissance uh, ages, um, uh, when pipers were pretty common folk um, in Europe and often associated with with the pastoral scene. Um, their instruments were made partly out of the animals they were looking after. So, um, And of course, if you go to the biblical story, biblical narratives of, of the birth of Christ, then 
the shepherds are very prominent in that story as well. Mm, yeah, there's also notable consistency in titles for these paintings that feature pipers. So many of them are the announcement to the shepherds. Um, That's right. Etc. Yep, exactly. There are a few really, uh, I found them very entertaining. Uh, uh, some paintings where there's a piper playing for the Christ child, the infant Jesus. Uh, and just to <laughs> imagine that happening. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure that would not have been allowed way back when, had there been yeah. bagpipes um, in those times. But uh, what decent mother would have allowed such a thing to happen? <laughs> exactly. I, uh, I, yeah, I found those very, very humorous. Well, um, maybe w could you tell me a little bit, Tim, specifically about how this collection came about? You know, what what called your interest to it? Uh, maybe which tunes got you started? Uh, what resources you went to to find, especially some of these uh, more obscure tunes? Um. Sure. Uh, yeah, um, I've I've grown up um, in the church, the Presbyterian Church specifically. Both of my parents now are ordained Presbyterians. Uh, when I was growing up, my father was a um, Presbyterian minister, and my mother, for a time, played organ for the church. So um, there's both the music and the kind of the theological influences uh, in one package right there mm, at I'm, home. I, and and, and if, you, if, you, if you don't mind me doing so, I'll in interject there then. That, 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 makes, that tracks for me, because a lot of the music that I've pulled from your website and, and uh, either just played or performed with other people has been these organ bagpipe duets. There you go. Um, and uh, so there's that influence uh, for sure. Also just the love of this repertoire. Uh, generally, I love the music that is associated with uh, Christmas, particularly the older European carols, but um, some newer material too. And then in terms of the organ, um, you have an instrument that's very closely related to the bagpipes. Um, some have... Uh, in days of yore, referred to the pipes as the poor man's organ. Mm. They're both bellows operated in some manner or other, and both have pipes and reeds um, to produce sound. Um, and they both have the capability of producing continuous sound, which almost no other instrument can do. Mm. So they have a lot in common. They blend beautifully. At the same time, you have the organ is generally more refined, and, and if it's well-tuned, it's tuned to a more modern temperament, equal temperament. The pipes tend to be a more natural, um, organic tuning called natural, uh, or just intonation, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and you put the two together and the, you know, the more refined, consistent tone of the organ pipes and the less consistent tones of the bagpipes, and you get this uh, clash on top of the, you know, uh, adjacent to the blend. And the clash is sort of between this pious organ and this profane you know, uh, yeah. bagpipe. And it's a, it's a wonderful tension that way. Mm. I, I wouldn't have been able to put it quite so eloquently. Um, but I definitely experienced that when a good friend, Scott and I did, um, O Come, O Come Emmanuel, the, the arrangement that you, that you put together of that one, we did it with a really big pipe organ and with the pipes sort of tuned as close as we could get them. You know what I mean? Yep. And, uh, yeah, definitely that tension between beautiful refinement and in its way, beautiful, natural madness um it added to it it ended up being you know not i don't think it took away from the experience i think it's part of what made it magical i totally agree uh and i think i think um audiences react to that as well in, in ways that surprise them even um natural madness i'm gonna borrow that phrase <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one so as you were putting this collection together is this a labor of you know was it slow moving for decades and then you realized hey i've got a collection going on here or did you kind of decide you know what i'm going to put something together because i can tell you when i was oh you know 14 15 years old playing pipes christmas time rolled around and it was like you know there's a school assembly or something let's go play a christmas song and it was like up on the housetop or you know <laughs> jingle bells you know heaven yeah. forbid you know and this i do not get the impression that any of the tunes in this collection are like if it says Christmas in the title and I can kind of make it work on pipes, I'm going to throw it in there. You know, these are, these are nice to listen to. If that, if that makes sense, I'm sure a lot of people listening will know that jingle bells on bagpipes is not necessarily pleasant, even when done, especially well, 
Maybe that's just no, my opinion, but <laughs> there might be a certain age group who would love that. Uh, sure. But uh, no, I tend to agree. And I started this. I probably I think a lot of these collections just started out as um, just kind of like, well, let me try a couple of tunes in this particular genre or some kind of exploration. And then you realize this is really fun uh, and there's lots more to explore. And then you get a little bit obsessed for a while. In the case of this book, um, I really, really wanted to do the absolute best job that I could with it. And um, uh, it was just an important topic for me and for an instrument that is uh, really I'm very passionate about. So uh, combining multiple passions just meant that I really wanted to, to do the best that I possibly could do with, with my skills and, and resources. So this, uh, I actually started this uh, eight years before it ended up being published, but it was um, a project that came and went in fits and starts and um, mm. uh, long, long pauses where nothing at all was happening. But uh, towards the end, I got extra focused and really, really went for it. So, but it, you know, eight years from start to finish in a way, in a sense. And uh, I mean, and I've got a copy of it here in front of me. I don't know if you've heard the pages rustling. I'm just kind of looking through it as we talk. Um, but the uh, we've got some. We've got just about 160 pages of music here. I think is that about how, is that about how many tunes there are in here? I mean, it's a thick collection. There are a lot. There's a lot of material here. Yeah, there are some that um, that are more than one page in length, uh, and some cases where I have artwork just on a on a filler oh, page. Course. There, it, I think it totals about a. 115 somewhere around 115 carols and and that's that is one thing that is remarkable about this collection tim that i couldn't name i don't think i could name 115 christmas carols even if i include popular music you know just off the top of my head but you've managed to pull together 115 once again they sound good on bagpipes you know 115 songs of the season that are also compatible with the bagpipes um what resources did you use? I, I, I'm going to guess that you maybe didn't already know of all of these tunes before going into the project. You're absolutely correct. Um, and I drew from a whole bunch of sources. Originally, um, the main source was the Oxford Book of Carols. Um, there, there's an older version from 1928, maybe, and then the new Oxford Book of Carols, uh, both coming out you know, of England. Um, I think that's dated 1992, possibly, but that is just a wealth of carols, familiar and obscure, uh, more along the traditional vein, which was, which is my preference to my, my general area of focus. Um, and they include a lot of background information as well. Um, I sort of borrowed their idea to have a little, little blurb, a little discussion about the carol, or maybe some tips on, on playing it or performing it. They do the same thing in, in their giant collection there, and um, it's superb. But there, of course, are many, many other sources, including regular old hymnals or various recordings, um, even some uh, collections of pipe tunes. Uh, one notable example is, is the tune called uh, Christmas is Coming, uh, which most traditional players know as the 3-2 hornpipe Rusty Gully. Mm. Or possibly Wee Willie Gray is another common title. Uh, but it just happens to have an, yet another title, Christmas is Coming, and I thought, why not include that? Yeah. Now, do you find that when looking through these older collections, like these collections you can get from, from the Oxford Press, etc., that they're, it's comparatively easy to find songs that will fit or tunes rather that will fit the you know the range restrictions of the bagpipes, or is it still kind of a needle in the haystack situation that requires a lot of you know looking and playing and testing and trying? It's sort of a mix of the two. That's a great question. Um, a lot of folk songs uh, are are designed. A lot of traditional music is designed to be accessible by the general public, more or less, um, and when you consider the general public uh, is not made up of professionally trained singers, then uh, you understand that, that songs that they're supposed to sing cannot have a, a really wide melodic span. They can't go, you know, a two octave range or something like, you know, you might find in some classical piece or operatic 
number. Um, so generally they tend to fit within an octave or pretty close within, uh, which suits our bagpipe chanter, a really limited bagpipe chanter. Mm -hmm. um, and older, older traditional carols also tend not to modulate. That is, they don't change key partway through as a lot of hymns and, and modern church hymnals will modulate halfway through. Yeah. Um, and that's a little trickier for us. Um, so, uh, yes, there are many carols, many more carols than are in this book, uh, that exist that are beautiful, that are worth exploring, but we can't play on our pipes, uh, and, and succeed. <laughs> yeah. Um, and do justice to the carol. Right? right. We might be offending the carol in one way or another if we, if we try too hard at it. Um, as I'm looking down the, the contents page, I'm seeing titles in English, French, Russian, German. Um, do you have off the top of your head just how many geographical areas or language traditions you're, you, are, you pulled from for this collection? You know, I don't. I haven't, I haven't really uh, done that tally, but um, a good portion. And, and the majority of the foreign ones would probably be French. They have a, a, a really... A huge canon of, of music associated with uh, Noel or Christmas. And I I wish, you know, if I'd thought of it, I would have looked at them to find out, but I'm curious if you know off the top of your head, do, do a lot of those French tunes that are in this collection follow that um, Breton style of playing where we've got, um, basically we're playing in a minor key or there uh, is there a fair mix of, of uh, minor to, to major sounding tunes in there? Uh, also a good question. I think there's a, a pretty good mix. Um, the Breton tunes definitely have a darkness about them, or a lot of them do, but there are many that are in a major key as well. I'm just mm. not sure they, they wound up in this tune book. Um, and for that matter, the French, you know, um, Bre it's probably worth clarifying to your listeners that um, the people of Brittany, of that, that part of Western France, that little nub that sticks out uh, westward into the Atlantic, they speak French, they eat croissants, they drink wine, um, but they don't really consider themselves entirely French. Mm. Um, they're really a Celtic blooded people with their own native language um, that is still spoken by some. It's, it's holding on for now, a bit like Welsh in that way, and it's very closely related to Welsh and Cornish. Um, so uh, they're, they're, the, the Breton and French traditions, there has been some overlap and some mixing, but they're also kind of distinct as well. I see. Now that's, I, I am relatively ignorant about the, the particularities of the Breton style bagpiping. Um, basically, the only identifier that I have when I'm hearing it is, does it sound like their C is taped down and or their F, <laughs> then it might be, you, you know, from Brittany instead of Scotland. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And that does bring up the fact that a lot of these tunes, I don't know about a lot, but certainly some of them, they have really helpful notes about, you know, in order to play this correctly, either use cross fingering or, you know, tape down your C and or your F or alternative tuning for the drones. That's right. Um, and I recognize that, that this is not familiar territory for a lot of pipers. And in some cases, uh, like changing the tuning of drones, it may not be possible, um, or at least not immediately. Um, you know, you can't just move a drone a certain way or swap the top of one drone that, and know that it will fit another drone and, and if change only. the length that way. I know, some, a lot of pipes do do that, um, but a number don't. Um, yeah. So I'm aware that there are many cases where this, some of these uh, offerings in the in the book may not be as accessible as um, uh, for some as they are for others. But um, yeah, there are I, also many that just fit this plain old Scottish chanter just fine. Yeah, so many, absolutely. It's not like it's a limiting factor in any way. And I have found in my own playing through this collection that if I'm playing on the Highland pipes, and you know, there's I need to tape down the C or or something, or there's something would sound better with different drone tuning. You know, sometimes it's just I cork off two drones and mess with the reed on the other to get it, you know, up a up a full tone or down a full tone or something like that. And yep. um, with the small pipes, you know, if I've got a, a bass, a bass, a baritone and a tenor drone and I can't get them into the right tuning, then again, you know, I just mute that mute that baritone. And so then I just have a consistent one consistent note and it works just fine. Yeah, uh, exactly. Um, and it does take some exploration, but. 
um, the more you do it, the more you sort of get accustomed to it. And you, the more you tend to find your, your own preferences, you discover what, what you, uh, get most excited about what tuning or what key or, um, is most interesting to your own ear. Mm. Yeah. I had, uh, one of those sort of magical moments just the other day as I was playing some of the tunes and I had recently got, I, um, replaced slash upgraded my set of Walsh small pipes to a, to an AD combo set. So I've got the four drones that I can play around with now. Great. And switching one of them just from playing E as the baritone note to D was like, just suddenly it's a, such a small change, but suddenly like so many tunes sounded so different as a result of, of that, that one small change. It was a lot they, of fun. They really do. And um, something I like to, to invite people to think about and ex experiment in workshops and, and in private teaching um, is to explore that the, there's usually two different uh, drone uh, uh, options per key that you're playing in. Um, one would be the, the first note of whatever scale you're based in. So if you're playing, say, Scotland the Brave, you're based in A. That's a tune that, that starts and ends on A, and um, that's its anchor. Obviously, tuning a drone to your chanter's low A is, is going to sound good. Mm -hmm. But there's always or almost always going to be uh, a second option that, that works almost as well. Um, and it's the fifth note of the scale. So if you consider A is one uh, and count up to five, you get to E. Uh, so sometime you should try playing Scott and the Brave or any tune in A with just an E drone going and just to hear how that sounds. Mm. Um, so that's an option for almost any tune that, that we would offer on our pipes. Mm. I wonder, I, this, is, this, this will be a fun experiment. I've never tried before. I've tried messing with my Great Highland Pipe drones somewhat, you know, like get an extra bass drone topper to put onto a tenor drone, stuff like that. But I, I, I've never tried just playing like the bottom section of the drone just to see how high that one can get. And how brash it might sound. It'll change <laughs> yeah. the tone as well. <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely. But it's so worth exploring. And, and uh, that is kind of another take on the word playing you, uh, an instrument. Oh, You're literally yeah. playing. Yeah. You're just having fun. Awesome. Well, uh, let's look, uh, Tim, if you, if you feel into it, at a few of the specific tunes in this collection. Um, one of them, and I just want to look at it right along with you here in the book, is on page six. It's in, the title is in, is it French? Ah, soli. I do not speak French. Oh, uh, that one is Latin, I think. Oh, is that I'm, Latin? I, I do I'm speak Spanish. I could, I could, I could murder it in that way. Take it You're welcome to try. A modern language. <laughs> You'll probably do better than I. I, I tend to pronounce it ah, solis ortus cardine. Um, and the tra I'm just opened it here, and I've got a copy of the book here too. So the translation uh, that um, my source. The, again, the new Oxford Book of Carols offers is from lands that see the sun arise. Mm. So one thing that stands out to me about this one just at first glance is there are no vertical lines separating the measures. Or they're very tiny, um, but you're right. Oh, Generally, you're right. I do see some of those teensy tiny ones. Uh, they, yeah, and that comes, you know, that's because when, when this music was written, there was not the standard notation style that we have now. Mm -hmm. um, so they sort of approximate, the editors of the New Oxford book approximate uh, what might be a phrase or a measure. Um, it's a sort of a Gregorian chant style song or carol. Um, yeah. So there's a, it's a different way of sort of thinking about phrasing. Yeah, and that's that's fun. I mean, looking at it, I'm like, okay, well, if that's a measure marker, is this what uh, a twelve four time signature or something along those lines? But Which then, will change for each little phrase yeah, as well. Yeah, that's different. Not all so 12 can, yeah, things, yeah. Very fun though. So listening to some Gregorian chants might give a person an idea of sort of how to feel this tune out. Precisely. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Sarum chant. Uh, um, was was practiced and, and written uh composed um i believe in starting around the 11th century uh up until the english reformation so three or four hundred years there uh in britain um but it was used um and interestingly it was used by i believe the roman catholic church and um the anglican church uh so both catholic and protestant 
um, their liturgy was was adopted by both in some cases. So this is a pretty old tune. Um, and yes, listening to Gregorian chant would, would help guide uh, an approach uh, to playing this instrumentally. And, and maybe I'm completely out in the woods with this, Tim. You, you tell me if I am, but it seems to me like Peabrook is seeing a real surge in popularity right now amongst Great Highland Pipers. Um, and this sort of, mm, what would you call it, sort of more less, less restricted sort of chant form that I think also would have been sort of something that would have been done on organs a long time ago as well and stuff. This, it feels similar to me, kind of meditative, Exactly, and I think uh, I think uh, in our modern, detached, distracted world, um, things that sort of help people uh, find a more meditative state, um, maybe even hypnotic, um, are becoming enjoying a, a kind of a surge in popularity like that. So I agree, this does have that sort of arrhythmic um, or freer. Uh, less defined pulse of, say, uh, uh, the ground of a Peabrock, mm -hmm. the way that Peabrock is performed currently, certainly. The arrangement that's in the carol book is uh, an experiment uh, of another sort, um, uh, which is where I kind of tried to imagine that the embellishments, some of our grace notes and, and embellishments, um, can be somewhat imitative of speech patterns and consonances and vowels and things like that in just the way we speak in, in any language. Mm -hmm. um, and I've often regarded our articulation patterns on the bagpipe chanter um, as something that sounds a little bit like bird song, a little bit like some foreign language or some alien language almost. You can almost hear words being spoken. And so for this arrangement, just, just to try it, uh, just to explore the the idea of it, I thought, why not try to match some of the grace notes with, or sort of imitate some of the consonants that are in the lyrics, the first verse anyways, with oh, yeah, our see how they line up. Yeah. more standard grace notes. Um, what I haven't really done yet is memorize those. I have performed this with a singer a few times. Um, and I, there is a video online uh, of that. I can't remember if I if she was singing the Latin while I was playing or not. But either way, I didn't have the, the these grace note patterns memorized, so I mm -hmm. wasn't really trying to match her consonants. But someday I would love for somebody to try that yeah. and just see if that has any interest or value at all. Oh, beautiful. Well, let's hop over then and look at um, page one fourteen in the collection. Another I can't pronounce. <laughs> well, we'll get to that one in just a moment. Um, well, in English, uh, a lot of us know this as the Christ Child's Lullaby. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the Gaelic would be something similar. Uh, I'm not a Gaelic speaker, but something closer to Tala Kriista. Mm -hmm. um, when you see accents, uh, when I see accents in Gaelic, I tend to assume that that requires a little bit of a... Um, an accent in terms of stressing that syllable. Yeah. 
I'm sure there's more nuance to that, but that's a start anyway. So one thing that I noticed when looking at this one, uh, similar to the tune we just barely talked about as well, is we do have uh, C natural throughout. Yes. Um, um, I know that it seems to me like some sets of pipes at some altitudes can get the, uh, some chanters, I should say, at some altitudes can get cross-fingering to work really well. But I know that for me, where I live at least, I, I pretty much can only use tape. I have to rely on tape to get this to work. Yeah, and are you talking highland pipes or small pipes or border pipes? Uh, I've only tried this on highland pipes and Scottish small pipes. Okay. Um, well, and, and this is where the, the bore of the chanter has a lot of influence and in what mm. notes can be cross-fingered. So uh, conically bored instruments like the highland pipes or the border pipes tend to have more success with the cross-fingering. But those of you out west at high altitude, it definitely changes things a lot. Mm. Um, and so that, that can lead to two other options. One is um, just using a piece of tape and fingering the C as you normally would, uh, though that can flatten the D a tiny bit depending on the channer. Mm -hmm. um, you can use tape again, but maybe not quite as much uh, as you were with your normal C sharp fingering. Uh, use it, just put a little bit less tape on that same hole and then combine that with the cross fingering Mm, that sure may also help work. Yeah. Yeah. And it may help that may allow your D to be a tiny bit less flat. Um, that's a good pro tip. I've never thought to try that. The other option, um, which might be less possible or, um, uh, people might not feel quite this daring, but, uh, some of us now have these extra thumb holes. So a thumb hole for our lower hand, mm. uh, in my case, it's my right hand. Um, that's on the back of the chainer. And if you finger a B and lift your back thumb away, opening that sound hole, then you get a very in tune C natural if it's been drilled in the right spot. Yeah. Um, I was lucky enough that my pipe maker is willing to just go ahead and do that to his own chanters. Um, so more and more, uh, I am making use of that particular feature. And let's give him a plug. Who makes your pipes? I've often wondered because I see you playing, you know, pipes that are in different keys and stuff in your various videos and, and all. I have a, a little bit of a hodgepodge, but by and large, uh, and increasingly, they are uh, pipes made by Nate Banton. Mm. Um, my first set of bellows pipes was a set of uh, Garvey um, border pipes made by Nigel Richards in Edinburgh. I still have the full set uh, and I still use the drones, but only for a few more weeks. I have some new drones coming in from Nate. Uh, I swapped the chanter out uh, with one that um, Will Woodson made. Um, Will is a partner with and has been a partner with Nate Banton over there in Portland, Maine. Um, and they used wood from a tree that used to grow in my backyard. Um, oh, that's amazing. That's which so is really fun. fun. Yeah. Um, so um, I have a few different, you know, chanters in different keys. I do have one uh, little D small pipe chanter made by Hamish Moore. Uh, probably back in the 90s, I, I bought that used. And uh, that's, yeah, in terms of bellows pipes, that's my mixture there. And then Highland pipes are Sinclair pipes from the 80s. Mm. That's the setup, huh? What's, um, I think it might be of interest, what's, what are some of the most clear div distinctions between border pipes and Scottish small pipes that you could point to? Yeah, there are two... Uh, uh, for the audience, at least for the listener, there are two um, really prominent differences. One is volume uh, and the other is tone. And it really has a lot to do uh, with the bore of the chanter. So as I mentioned earlier, there's the conical bore. So it's cone shaped um, for highland pipes and border pipes. That makes them sound louder. Uh, the expanding bore uh, makes them louder and also higher pitched. And there's sound holes, you know, where your fingers are. The finger holes tend to be a little larger too, mm. and the reeds may be a little bit, um, a little bit stiffer, requiring you know more air pressure to get them to vibrate. Mm. Small pipe chanters have a cylindrical bore, so it's more parallel, um, which is closer to a clarinet or a flute. And if you imagine those two instruments, you can understand that why the small pipes tend to sound both quieter and a little bit more mellow. Oh yes, that makes a lot of sense.
this is another favorite melody of mine. I don't recall when I first heard it, but I do recall that um, falling in love with the melody the, the moment that I heard it and was thrilled that it was Scottish. Uh, but then I hit the stumbling block that, oh, this doesn't naturally fit the Scottish pipe changer. Um, it requires uh, some manipulation of the C uh, to pull that down from a C sharp to a C natural mm -hmm. and get the modality right. You could you can try playing it with a, a C sharp, but it will change the mood of the tune entirely. So I definitely suggest finding some way to get that C natural if any of you are trying that. But it's just a gorgeous, simple melody and uh, a really nice one to perform and invite the audience in on the refrain, which is simply Alleluia. That's an easy word. People already know it. Uh, they don't have to speak Gaelic or memorize lyrics. They can just, they've heard the melody sung on the verse. Now they can sing the Alleluia against the same melody. Beautiful. I noticed that it's listed uh, modally as being uh, D, Mixolydian, and the drone note here says D and or A. Exactly. And so that, um, that relates to my earlier point where you often have two very good options for tuning your drones to, um, to whatever melody you're playing. I happen to be sitting next to my piano. I had a feeling it might come in handy here. Yeah, so give us some if, of that. If you'll allow. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's just much more quickly to, to, to demonstrate different keys and tunings uh, without having to inflate the bag. So the melody, one version of the melody is... So you can have a D drone. pretty much just as well. And sometimes the fifth note will work even better. And together. So for most of the um, the little key box that I put above uh, tunes that I publish, and that's become a real habit of mine to do that, um, I'll encourage people to to try two different drones, singularly singularly or uh, together, if I think it works. They both work for the tune. Yeah, I mean that's a lot of fun to just go through and, and hear how how they are different each each one of those, but you know each very pretty. Um, I noticed that you also include chords in with a lot of your arrangements, and as in the case, as in this case with this tune, a melody or excuse me, a harmony line as well. Do you have favorite instruments with which to play a lot of these, uh, you know, small pipe tunes? Oh gosh, uh, no, no real favorites. Um, of course, um, I've played with uh, Jeremiah and Alex a lot, so the accordion. And the fiddle or nickel harpa, Alex uh, is, a, is a really great nickel harpa player. That's probably a whole other episode talking about the nickel harpa. Mm -hmm, yeah, what is um, that? <laughs> exactly. It's wonderful Swedish medieval keyed fiddle. Um, so this tune sounds great with those. It sounds great with the organ. It sounds great with a fiddle or a harp. Um, really, the, the sky's the limit. Yeah, I love that. I, I, I can't remember off the top of my head if there's any of these in this collection, but I love that in some of your other collections, you've included some alternative melody notes where if the traditional melody line is limited when, you know, like you can't get there with the Highland pipe or small, you know, Scottish small pipe uh, chanter, you put in parentheses, here's where you could go with the melody here in case you have a fiddle playing that line and the pipes are playing the harmony line or or something else. Exactly, or some singing it. Uh, yeah, singing it, absolutely. I guess that's, maybe that's where I'm seeing most of it is that in your collection, uh, how can I keep from singing? Yeah, uh, exactly. So um, we do have such a limited instrument and so many great melodies. Just love to nudge up one note higher than we can normally play. Um, and sometimes they're important notes, other times they're just passing turns. Um, so, but I like to include that information just so people know 
there is that option, or maybe that was the original uh, intention for the melody, but here's what we can do as pipers. Yeah. Yeah. And another thing I appreciate about a lot of your arrangements is that like, um, I'm trying to think, I think it's the wondrous love arrangement that I got for pipes and, and organ that, um, you publish it in a and in D and it's really useful, especially for someone who's coming to this from a piping specific Highland piping specific position. Cause you can have music for the organ or excuse me, maybe it was, was it D and B flat? What, what, it, what all I'm getting at is that you can have the written music in A, as it were, so that a Highland Piper can play that, whether they are on a B-flat chanter or a D whistle or anything, and it's very familiar for them. But then the accompanist can be looking at something that is printed in the quote-unquote, well, not even quoted, the, the real key, as it were, the key that's the sounding, sounding. Yeah, the sounding key, exactly. Um, sure, and that's, uh, that's a standard practice from uh, a lot of orchestral instruments or, say, uh, Jazz, some jazz instruments like the saxophone, they're transposing, which means the, the notes that the, the player is seeing is not what we're actually hearing. Um, but for the sake of, you know, being able to swap instruments or swap chanters in our case and not have to equate the same fingering pattern to several different notes, um, it's, it does make life easier for the person reading the music for the piper or, yeah. or whomever. Yeah. Oh, I love it that I love that it makes you know a lot of pipers play the low D whistle, and it 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 makes it makes uh, it makes session playing very accessible to have that sort of transposed in writing for us basically. Yeah. No, it it can really help. I agree. Cool. Uh, any other notes you'd like to, or any other info you'd like to share about this tune? I don't think so. Um, what's what I'm realizing. Um, you know, when you had asked some favorite carols um, ahead of time, and I, I sort of picked these three that, that tend to re reappear and reemerge in my repertoire um, every year for, for various events that I play for in December. Um, it's, there are three different modes. So we're, we've looked at two. The, um, the A solis ortus cardine is, is um, based in the uh, Dorian mode, I think. Uh, I should probably go and just double check that while I'm talking. But it's, uh, I think it's an important kind of having a little bit of understanding about the different modes. Um, yeah. yeah, that one is in, in Dorian. Um, having a little bit of understanding of, of what we mean when we talk about modal and, and how they create these different flavors. And again, the piano will be very helpful probably in that regard. So uh, with Asolis Ortus Cardine, that one is in the Dorian mode. It's basically a minor scale. But the sixth note is raised. It's a major sixth. Um, and uh, that, that's used a lot in Celtic music um, and I think some Scandinavian as well. That's yeah. my all-time favorite mode. It's mostly dark, but there's this ray of sunshine, that, that sixth. That ray of sunshine, that ray of hope that comes cutting through that, the darkness otherwise. And I really, really love that, that particular mode. Mm. Um, and I should maybe mention very briefly here, uh, when we, a lot of us traditional players refer to modal music, we're referring to something that's neither major you know, that, that um, generically happy key, mm -hmm. nor fully minor, which is more generically a, a sad emotion. Uh, which, so it's happy and sad, but go ahead, sorry. Oh, just it, sort of in, in, in very bagpipe-centric language, that would be like major would be your C and F are normal. They're sharp, but they are, they're left as they are, Yeah. Correct, and and the most majorish tunes that we play are tunes in the key of D. Um, so, um, think of any Amazing Grace, right? Amazing Grace, the, the high drive is a great example, mm, yeah, because um, that uses all of the notes of the scale, and it's firmly in D major and f has that happy, happy, optimistic, bright outlook. Um, a fully minor key on a bagpipe uh, without using tape or any trickery would be B minor. So um, the haunting or 
the mist covered mountains or Patty's leather britches, mm. those are all in that m more forlorn, depressed key. By contrast, modal music is, is often a mix, a hybrid of the two, and, and often in different ways. It can be mostly sad, but with that ray of hope, or mostly happy, but with some nostalgia. It's more complicated uh, emotionally, I think. And for me, that's much more interesting. Yeah. So fast forward to uh, the Christ Child's Lullaby, and we're in Mixolydian. And we pipers play in the Mixolydian mode all of the time uh, when we're based in A, almost all the time when we're based in A. Um, the Battle of Waterloo or Bonaparte crossing the Rockies is firmly mm. in A Mixolydian. But here we're in D Mixolydian, and that's just... Mixolydian is another way of saying a major scale. But we're taking the seventh note and making it flatter. So it changes the mood. It also changes the chords underneath. A one chord sounds like that. Uh, in a major key, a four chord, also major. Oh, sorry, that's the five chord. Here's the four chord, five chord, and one. All major uh, in the major key. In modal, it changes the chords even. And suddenly the whole mood is, is uh, altered um, for me in a really intriguing way. And correct so, me if I'm wrong, Tim, but I'm thinking that one thing that might be very relatable for a lot of pipers is their experience playing versus hearing different renditions of Minstrel Boy. Huh. That yeah. on, on the pipes, it sounds one way, but if you try to play it on the penny whistle without an, you know, an alternative fingering, um, it comes out a little different. And if you hear some popular recordings of it, 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 you know, it's like, oh, that's kind of different. It doesn't quite sound exactly the same. And I, I, I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's just a modal change because of what the seventh note being uh, a half tone higher or lower from one to the exactly. other. Exactly. That's exactly it. And there's so many cases where pipers have taken a melody that, that really kind of needs that seventh note to be sharp, to be raised would be another way of saying that. Um, and we just compress it into our our own... Mm -hmm. mode and it changes the mood and which, sometimes which, it, that's that's our g right sometimes our g exactly. is just sharp or flat exactly we don't really normally have a g sharp on our bagpipe channers so yeah. um, that tune would normally have it a fiddler playing that tune in the same key would play a g sharp we don't have the option and so uh it comes out modal um and some people find that utterly charming other people are really irritated by it. <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Well, um, let's look at the other mode then uh, with page 134 in the collection. Sure. And here we're kind of returning to a um, happier, more fully major tonality. Um, and this one is a um, somewhat well-known hymn in a lot of church hymnals. Um, the German title, I understand, is Trustet, Trustet Meine Lieben, I think, something like that. That sounded translation. really really good to me as a oh. person who does not speak German and never been to well, Germany. I thought that sounded like great German. I, I, I'm totally faking it, but, uh, we'll just go with it. Um, comfort, comfort ye, my people is, is the common English translation for that. And this is, uh, the, it's sort of thought of as a British carol, but, but in fact, the, the melody is believed to have been written by Louis Bourgeois. Uh, in the Renaissance, uh, a French composer um, who wrote a lot of music for the church way back when. And so it has a sort of Renaissance flair to it in that the rhythm is, is really, uh, it changes the, the meter in a way. We don't really write it that way necessarily, um, but from measure to measure, it can feel like it's either in 6-8 or 3-4 or some weird hybrid like that. Yeah. And it's very, um, I find very addictive tune and rhythm both.
best of all, I love the, the lyrics, um, which he, uh, Louis Bourgeois did not write, I believe, Johann O'Lyrius um, was the, the lyricist, and then later translated into English. But they are just very hopeful um, lyrics, which is perfect for the season of Advent. It's really, a, um, you know, this is the time of longing and, and of hope for, um, well, for better times and, and a number of different ways. So both the music and the text align beautifully uh, for that effect in this, in this carol. Uh, I can add that, um, that when I have uh, heard this sung in churches, it's often been sung at a very slow tempo. And I think that's because um, church music directors and organists might might be afraid that the congregation will be confused by the, the changing rhythms, the changing meter, and that it's not a, a classic 4-4 four, four mm. or 3-4 pulse. Um, and so out of, out of a fear of confusing people, they slow it down. Um, when you take this melody up to a, a faster clip, it really blossoms, it really comes alive. And um, when we've done this with live audiences, the the effect on our listeners is is really obvious and palpable. They they at some in some cases have leapt to their feet and clapped um, mm. in delight. Just they they can't they can't resist uh, when you have a really good piece of music and the right groove to it. Um, people can't help but move in some way, um, and that's what it's it's kind of designed for. Um, in fact, what carols uh, were ultimately uh, grew out of uh, the idea of singing. And dancing at the same time. That's the origin of the, the word carol, I believe. Huh, I didn't know that. Um, if I could, if I can convince you to stay on for just a few more minutes, Tim. Sure. Um, I'd love to talk one more tune. Um, I'm not sure exactly which one. Some sort of, sort of, sort of low-hanging fruit in that it would be simple and straightforward. Something that some of our newest pipers would think, I'm going to play that, you know. Um, which I hope they think that of any of the tunes we've already talked to or talked about already, but I'm thinking maybe something that they've heard before for sure and is in pretty simple meter that they could just hop right onto their Highland pipes or anything and play. Yeah, um, there's of course, um, you know, uh, Adeste Fideles, uh, which is O Come All Ye Faithful. Um, that's a really common one in a lot of church hymnals. Let's run with that one. I, th okay. I, I would be very surprised if anybody hadn't heard that one. Um, let's see. That's oh, it's page on page two. Thank you. Right at the top there. Tell me about this tune. Um, all right. So uh, this is also, you'll note that I did not use the common title for, uh, for printing this, though I include it as a subtitle. Yeah. Um, o Come All Ye Faithful. We all know, we all know that one. Or, pretty much all of us. Um, Adeste Fideles, I think, would be the pronunciation of the Latin title. Um, and this is where it might be good to sort of point out that in a lot of church hymnals, you have one piece of music, one melody that's used for several different poems, several different sets of lyrics. Um, that can have nothing, almost nothing to do with each other. Mm, I have um, seen in hymnals before that a lot of times hymnals will have at the back a section where you can get, there's a list of um, tune titles and it runs parallel to a list of how many, wh which hymns in that book run with this melody line, basically. Exactly. I can always pick the people who have been at least bored during a sermon <laughs> yeah. exploring in, in the hymnal. <laughs> um, so that's exactly it. There are tune titles and then there are lyric titles. And um, most of us tend to be familiar with the lyric titles, that, you know, which is drawn from the poetry of whatever we're singing. Um, but you should know that each hymn has its own tune title too. So in the case of the most well-known hymn of all, uh, Amazing Grace, Amazing Grace is actually the lyric title. That's the poetry that was put to the tune that is known as New Britain. Mm. So if you're referring just to the music itself, you could get really geeky and say, uh, well, we're playing New Britain. Um, and in your heads, you could even imagine all of those letters in all caps because to distinguish between the two, um, church musicians tend to use all caps for the, the tune name and then 
the mixture for the lyric title. Mm -hmm. So here we have Adeste Fidelis, that would be the tune title, and then O Come All Ye Faithful is the lyric title. And this is just a really, really well-known melody and set of lyrics, and they pair together really well. Um, this is in any hymnal, but I, I thought I would go to one of my most trusted sources again for this, the New Oxford Book of Carols. Um, and uh, they don't seem to know the origin of, of either the tune or the text here. I love it when that happens. I think that's so fun. You know, yeah, you who knows how all kinds of things. Yeah. Especially when we're, we're dealing with some Latin text here. Yeah. It would be really old. Um, but it's classic, standard 4-4 four, four rhythm, very accessible. It's in the key of D major, so it's a bright, happy key. Um, we don't have to do anything weird for our pipes. Yeah, we even have that note there, drones A only, and that is get your Highland pipes out. That's what they're doing. Exactly. And if you play this with a church organist on a, a conventional set of Highland pipes, just know that your pipes are sounding one half step uh, a semitone higher than what you're thinking or what you're reading. Or so, at least approximately depending on where your pipe major had you at the last practice, right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of wiggle room there. But that will help your organist. So uh, if you go one, the, the very next key above D on a piano is D sharp or E flat. It would be much more uh, easy for the organist to think in E flat. So you're thinking in D, you're reading in D, um, but in fact, you're sounding in E flat if you're playing this on Highland pipes. And that's what you would tell your accompanist. Um, and, uh, and this is essentially the motivation behind the, any purchase of B flat chanters is basically to bring your pipes down that half step. So you can just all be looking at the same thing rather than forcing your accompanist to shift up a half step. Yeah. Uh, the organ that's in the symphony hall, the concert hall at the um, Maison Symphonique up in Montreal, the, the Montreal Symphony Orchestra, they have a fairly new hall there with a new pipe organ. There are 7,000 pipes for that one <laughs> pipe organ. Amazing. So imagine trying, you know, it takes us a while to sort of retune our pipes, our chanter and our drones and get everything just so and stabilized. But imagine having to tune 7,000 pipes. Um, it definitely helps to have a B flat chanter and it makes your job easier getting in tune to a true B flat or, you know, the modern day B flat. Yeah. Um, so that your poor organist, uh, can be in tune with you and not have to retune yeah. hundreds or thousands of pipes. Yeah, absolutely. It might be just nice to remind folks that these, uh, these carols are ultimately about a very hopeful story. Um, and especially when we're going through a tough period, it's great to be reminded that there's a lot of music that has survived some very dark times um, and helped many people get through some very dark times. So by all means, play, uh, explore the, the, the repertoire of Christmas carols, whether you're drawing from this book or anything else. There's some great music there. And also don't forget that uh, the basis in dance, um, that carol comes from... from the idea of singing and dancing with others um, at the same time. <laughs>